Today's interview is with Jacqueline Marshall. Jacqueline's out in Ontario, Canada. Um, she owns six rental properties that she self-manages, but now she also has transitioned into doing flips that she does the majority of the work herself. Um, and she has some interesting stories about uh, that. So stick around for all of today's awesome, awesome interview. Hello and welcome to Wrestling With Real Estate, where we look to choke slam all your real estate problems. I'm your host, former WWE wrestler and now Cirque du Soleil performer, and of course, multi-family real estate investor, Barry Griffiths. Now today we're joined by Jacqueline. Hey, Jacqueline. Very, thank you for having me. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure. I'm excited to jump into today's conversation. But uh, before we do that, do you want to tell people a little bit about your background, what you've been up to and what your current focus is? So I have been in real estate uh, officially and fully aware for the past six -ish years. Um, I have six uh, single family homes uh, that are a little bit more that they're homes that uh, attract a more uh, top shelf tenant, shall we say. Um, and I have a long waiting list sometimes to get into to them. Uh, people wait and wait and wait. Um, and then for the past three years, I, I, after six doors, I didn't want to add uh, rentals to my portfolio because I self-manage uh, everything. My tenants, I find them, I screen them. I do everything. I do the maintenance on my homes myself. So I felt I, uh, I had taken on enough for myself at that time. I didn't want to overwhelm myself. And uh, so I got into flipping houses three years ago. And I started off with lipstick, I call it lipstick flips. And these are basically um, just uh, homes that don't need extensive renovations in order to get a profit at resale. So it's, it's just purely cosmetic. It was things that I could do all myself. Um, and I've graduated, I've taken that experience and I've gra uh, rolled that experience and knowledge and everything. And I rolled that into the next house and each house kept requiring more and more extensive renovations. So I've gone from something that I can 100% do myself and it's all cosmetic, therefore a low budget. I started off with a $10,000 rehab budget and I, that's how I started out. And now the, the house that I'm doing now, which is uh, the Wellington project, this, this is what I've graduated into where um, it's pretty much a full gut. This house was not habitable when I bought it. Uh, it needed rewiring, it needed the plumbing redone, and uh, yeah, I just basically didn't, if I had started out with this uh, flip, this kind of flip, I think I would have been very overwhelmed and ran, run for the hills a long time ago, but yeah, my confidence grew with each flip, and my knowledge, and my experience, and uh, each house, I was able to get whatever strategies I needed to navigate through that flip and make it successful. I was able to uh, learn and uh, just put strategies into place to be successful and not overwhelm or not want to um, throw the towel in and run for the hills. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. I, and, uh, let's touch on afterwards because I think that's an important um, point, right? Is because a lot of people do get overwhelmed they do throw the towel in right and you know there's various reasons for that but I think it's great that you were able to figure out a way not to get to that point because mm -hmm. it's, yeah. it's also momentum a lot of real estate is momentum right once you kind of get yeah. going and do, do a few and do a few more you know it starts that snowball and the snowball gets mm -hmm. bigger and bigger and you get better and better and you know yeah. to a lot of success like that you, you said you, you got into it fully aware six years ago what what brought mm -hmm. you to real estate you think so I mean it's it's kind of funny and it's kind of quirky. I mean, uh, so I did not enter into real estate investing intentionally, did not know that I had gotten on that path. And what I, why I say that is because I had my personal home. I was a, a dental hygienist and I wanted to move out of the area. So I put my house up for sale. It did not sell. And ironically enough, now it is one of my best rental <laughs> units, that house, uh, but we can get back to that. So that house did not sell for whatever reason. And I look back on it now and obviously God and the universe had a different plan for me because if that house had sold, I would probably still be a hygienist, you know, and I wouldn't be in the boat that I'm in financially that I'm in now. So anyhow, that house didn't sell. I contacted my realtor and said, I really want to get out of this area and uh, I'm going to rent this house. I'm going to buy another one. So that's what I did. 
And so I was in that other house, the second house for about a year. And I thought, huh, well, I don't want to stay here, but I'm having a really positive experience with and good luck with the tenants that I have at my other home. It wasn't a negative experience. I was, it was just going really well. So I felt like, oh, I'm going to take on another one. So I rented the second house out and moved on to the third one and the same thing happened. <laughs> so, you know, it just slowly built, it's slowly built up that way over like a three, three plus, you know, ish years. And I got the six doors and then I was just like, by that point in time, I knew, became a little bit more aware of real estate investing. Um, and I saw the financial freedom and it bankrolling the lifestyle that I wanted for myself and doing this independently without anyone else. And so I walked away from hygiene and, uh, and just went for it. I, I just made it work and just, I just made it work. I put the work in, I, I put the tears in, I put the blood in, I, yeah, I, I just put it in. It, there was no going back. Once I got a taste of that vision and what real estate investing could give me and the, the, the retirement security it could give me because uh, I had RSPs uh, with the bank. I don't know if you have that down in the States or if you know what that is, the retirement savings plan that we have here in Canada. It's one of our systems. And I remember sitting at the bank talking to my financial girl and going, please explain to me how this is going to grow into something that I can retire on and enjoy the lifestyle I want and enjoy the things I want when I retire. And um, so, yeah, so once I got a taste of this real estate investing and the money and the lifestyle, and if, if you put the work in and, you know, do your due diligence and be open to it and make concessions, make sacrifices, this can happen. This could, this could bankroll a li any lifestyle that you want. I'm convinced of that. So, yeah. No, and it is right. And it's amazing. Like that's why I love about real estate as well. It's like, it doesn't take a lot, right? You've talked about that. You have six properties and you, essentially what you did is you did a, you lived in it for a year. No, it, it, you found this strategy, I'm guessing by accident, it seems like a little bit, but then it's a great mm -hmm. strategy. Like it's a, the house hack, I, think, I guess they kind of call it. But you know, you buy a property, you put, you don't necessarily need to put a lot of money down because you're living in it as your primary. And then after a year, you can move out and do it the same again, right? And soon enough, mm -hmm. If you do that for six years, like you said, you have six rental properties, right? You know, and it can, yeah. you know, they, they're cash flowing and they, they can kind of, like yeah. you said, support a lifestyle that you're looking for yourself. So I think it's, it's an amazing strategy. That, that first one, why do you think it was, it didn't sell? Was it just the case of the market at the time? That's where the market was at when you, when you. I would love to know because okay. <laughs> I bought that house. This was my principal house. I bought it some years ago and I lived in it for X number of years before, um, I decided, I mean, I bought it a long time ago and I believe I lived in it six or seven, five or seven years. I lived in it before I said, okay, I want to move out of the, the neighborhood and the area. Um, so I bought it for 191 or 192. And so when I went to put it up for sale, I had it up for, and it was, you know, comparable to the, all the prices of the other homes that were selling, obviously, you know, my agent gave me the comps and, um, it was around 350 or 380. And that was, that's what I had it up for sale about six years ago. And it didn't sell for whatever reason. I don't know. I just think that, you know, like I said, I just think that, you know, faith and everything just had a different plan for me. And that same house now, I could, without putting a dime into it or doing anything, I could sell this house now for five seventy five, no problem. Oh. <laughs> like no problem. So yes. Yeah, because, of, because of the developments around it. This is in a subdivision, a very nice subdivision in a very upscale community. And um, the houses, the developments that are going around it, the new bills for the past three years, they all start at $1 million plus. So, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. that helps so, pricing a lot. But it just yes. goes to show, right? And I, I hear it and I've witnessed it myself is that sometimes you think something's a setback, right? Like you said, that you, you wanted to sell that house, it wouldn't sell. Mm -hmm. But then that started you down this other path that you may never, ever have found. Right? It was a blessing. It was a blessing in disguise. Like I would, if, if that house had sold, I don't think I would have gotten on the path that I'm in and the light bulb wouldn't have gone off. Right. And, you know, yeah. So I definitely wouldn't be enjoying what I'm enjoying and the, the financial peace of mind that I have right now. I wouldn't be enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. So what, what did you, what, what was the learning curve on that first one? How much education did you put into yourself? 
to to learn how to find a tenant, how to screen a tenant? Or did you just literally think, okay, I need to write this thing out. Let me just find someone and put it in there. Because you know, when when you don't know, right? That's what you think you do, right? You put it for rent mm -hmm. and then whoever comes up, if they can afford it, you put it in there, right? I've been there mm -hmm. myself. But then mm -hmm. soon enough you <laughs> realize that's not necessarily the case. How how did how was that process for you and how did that go for you? Uh, a couple of things like for for finding tenants, I've had really good luck. I've never had a really bad negative experience. Um, I also have a phenomenal uh, agent who's also he also has uh, rentals and things like that of his own my real estate agent. And so he has been a fantastic resource over the years whenever I have a question regarding anything real estate and um, so with my first tenants, I would go on Kijiji and I would see like, you know, what, uh, what the houses in the area, like, what are they renting for? I want to be like, you know, fair to the market. Right. So that went well, but I did have a negative experience. I started off by giving everyone my phone number oh. <laughs> and <clears throat> let's just say that that did not have a, that I ended up changing my strategy and my strategy ended up being uh, I now do it open house style. So um, because this negative experience, um, I had to call the police on this person because what I was worried about was, oh, my God, what about if he's contacting women and setting up meeting places to meet them one on one at potential rentals and then something very nefarious can happen? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I contact I, I reported him to the police. So in case he had a history of, you know, women, you know, uh, reporting him or something like that. So <clears throat> I never so. Moving forward, I never did one-on-one -on -one anymore. I never met anyone. I do it open house style. And I basically give two or three um, open house options. Like I'll do it on a Wednesday from two to five. And then I'll do a, a, maybe a Friday. I'll do a Sunday and try to meet everybody. And they, and they all come in. I give them an application. They have to fill out the application. Um, and I check all that. I, I fact check it. Like uh, if people tell me this is where they live, I drive by where they say they live. I drive by where they say they work. Yeah. And if I don't see the license plate that they provided me in the workplace um, parking lot, I'll ask them about it. You know, because you told me you work this day. So how come I didn't see your car there? I will straight out ask people and I'll drive by. And yeah. And it's that, that that system has worked out really well for me. I've never, never, ever, ever really, except for that one time on Kijiji, I, I can't really, I've had to have some big girl conversations with some tenants, but uh, you know, you just deal with it and, you know, respectfully and professionally and yeah, it all works out. Yeah. And I, I think that's smart, right? It's easy. The thing is these days as well is not only can people tell you something that's not true, they can, um, fake stuff, right? I've heard of plenty of stories of people getting fake pay stubs online, getting um, mm. fake letters from employers online. You know, you want to check it, double check mm -hmm. everything, right? Make sure. Because mm -hmm. once you have that tenant in, right, it's it's easier to put the tenant in than it is to get them out, right? Once they're in- I've never had to cross that bridge yet. Okay. I've never had to cross that bridge. Um, and even with uh, COVID, when this happened in March, uh, I don't know if this happened in your area, but uh, there was rumors where they were the, the tenants were going to go on strike and not pay rent or whatever for April 1st and because of COVID. And um, so the strategy I put in, I, but again, I have uh, some top shelf tenants who have uh, very secure sources of income. So I did not see any of them doing that to me because they're very um, white collar, I guess. And um, but it just to, just across to my T's and dot my I's, I contacted them two weeks before uh, April 1st and wanted to know and familiarize myself with their, their situation because I don't know. Right. And uh, if, and I made it very clear that, you know, I'll work with you if something comes up or because I don't want to see anyone being short on, you know, for food or medical things, you know, so I'll work with you, but it never, and still to this date, I just don't have, a, everyone's paid their rent. So I'm, I'm lucky. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm you, lucky. Mentioned it, you mentioned it earlier that you, you got, you kind of go for, um, I guess a higher class of tenants, it, it, you know, is, is one way to explain. Um, what, was yeah, my, my homes tend, uh, because they're homes that I, uh, because I started out, 
not with the intention of buying and fixing and renting it. So I looked, I was buying them with the thing like, oh, I'm going to live here. I'm going to stay here. So it kind of reflected me and my lifestyle and things like that. And because of the house and the street and the location, it attracted um, uh, good tenants. Good, just, you know, like, like I said, white collar, like some of them are lawyers uh, and, and things like that. They're business owners and just things like that. So. Yeah, and, and, and I found the reason I was bringing that is I found that obviously it's challenging, right? With a, to find maybe you've had more luck, but so the the more expensive the areas, um, the harder it is to find deals, right? There's less less distress a lot of times, and it's harder mm -hmm. to find deals in that. But what I found is if you're able to buy in those areas, right, B plus A areas, is that you get much better tenants that are able to take care of the property. So even if the cash flow is less. You're mm -hmm. going to be paying a lot less in repairs and maintenance. They take a lot more pride in the in the in the, in the yeah. property. They have you know pride of pride of ownership mm -hmm. or pride of renting it. Um, mm -hmm. And then when it comes to turns and things like that, your expenses are much lower. You know, and the, the chances they hold themselves more accountable. I'm exactly. finding too. My tenants, um, they uh, they just take yeah they they just take pride in where they live and while they're renting for that uh, term while they're with me. And um, just very accountable, just very up and straight. And they'll be like, oh, Jacqueline, this happened. And I'll be like, okay, you know, so. Yeah. yeah, and I've also found as well, yeah, that's very true. And what I've also found is that usually these, you know, these nicer places that cost more rent, right? The ones that I've owned that cost more rent. So if you're paying a premium in rent, that's a screening mm -hmm. process in itself, right? If they can afford, mm -hmm. you know, one of my properties I was renting out for 2,600 a month, right? Mm -hmm. so if you can afford a 2,600 a month, Mortgage and you have to get first and last too. Yeah. So if you can come up with 2,600 times two, I mean, right. you're doing pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then that's kind of, I see, not, not to say that rich people or people that are doing well don't do bad things, but mm -hmm. you're limiting, yeah. I think, that, that cause there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you bought the first one, it became an accidental landlord, essentially, right? That's what, <laughs> that's what happened to me for sure. That's what, yeah. But then you, the light bulb went off and then you bought the second one. When, when you were buying these, were you buying them with a lower? Um, down payment we utilizing that owner occupied does that exist in, in where you are because here in the u.s you can get down get in a property with as little down as three and a half percent i've never heard of three and a half percent um but uh i've always put down i forget the the initials now it's but uh here in ontario i don't know if it's in in the states as well but if you put down at 30 percent you avoid uh cm ch fees or something like that i'm probably screwing that up what i'm saying yeah. but uh, anyone Canadian knows what I'm talking about if they hear me talking on this podcast um, here in Ontario. And uh, so I think it's 25 or 30%, I forget now. So if you put that down, that minimum down, and these weren't expensive homes, you know, uh, in the market that I was in, we're not talking about three, five, seven, seven hundred thousand dollar homes. Uh, like I said, the first one that I bought, my home that I rented, ended up running out. It was 191, 192 that I purchased it for. And then the second house that I bought, it was like a little bungalow. It's, uh, it's seven, eight hundred square feet, and it was just pure luck that I got it for what I got it for. I got it under market value because everything else on that street was going for 180, 195, and I got it for 144. So yeah. So I just put the the down payment that I needed to put down because I had the I had that those resources, and um, yeah, and I've never gone over 180. I've never gone over 180 thousand. Uh, I've just had really good luck at buying what I buy and uh, taking it on, renovating it, being able to rent it, and yeah, and everything that I have, it's gone so much, so much up in appreciation, like every year because of the areas that I've bought in, and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just so thankful for what I'm sitting on. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah, uh, what 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 uh, what do those uh, properties rent for? So, like for for example, the first one you I think you said you bought for one ninety one. What does that one rent for now? That is twenty two hundred a month plus utilities. Okay, oh, so you, it's more than the one percent rule, then I guess. And this is a duplex, or sorry, like it's a um, a semi detached. It's not a fully uh, fully detached house. It's a semi semi uh, detached. So a fully detached home in the same area community where uh, this is, it goes up to about 23 to 2,900 for a fully detached house. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, but yeah. mine goes for what it does. And, it, and they're all rented like that plus utilities, plus utilities. Right. Yeah. Yep. And then the bungalow, how much does that one rent out for? That one is 1,700 plus utilities. Oh, I 
Okay, that's a great deal. <laughs> and that's my cheapest one. Like all my rents, like for everything, it's from seventeen hundred uh, to you know twenty one, twenty two. So depending on the market value. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm sorry for anyone listening. I'm from the UK and you're from Canada. We both know what a bungalow is, but for anyone in the US, I don't think they know what a bungalow is. Are you serious? <laughs> no, you don't use that word don't, down there? They don't call them bungalows here. Yeah. No. <laughs> so what's a bungalow? It's a house. <laughs> it's a one story house, right? That's <laughs> easy for people to remember. It's yeah. just essentially yeah. it's just some, what we call a one story house. Okay. Um, yeah, it's yeah. a house. Yeah. They, yeah. They don't call them bungalows here. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> pretty, pretty well, what do you call it then? A one story house, I guess. I don't know. One story house? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. They need to start calling it bungalows. Let's start calling it bungalows and then maybe they'll, they'll, they'll try and okay. call it too. Yeah. Um, so that, so with, with each property that you kept buying, do you buy um, ones with big, that needed bigger renovations or were they all just a little bit that, like you mentioned, that needed a little bit of... Um, the second one, it did need a fair amount of restoration. Mm. Um, it was an older home. It's, it's the oldest rental that I have. Um, but because of the area, I bought that one five years ago or a little over five years ago. And it, like I said, everything on that street was going for 188, 195 in that area. And it was an estate sale. So I really snagged it at 144. So even when I purchased it, I was already sitting on, I could have turned around and resold it for, you know, 195 or maybe even 200 at, at once I cleaned it up. Um, but I sat on it and it was the oldest of all my uh, rentals that I have. And it needed waterproofing down in the basement. So, um, I put a lot, I put a lot into it. So I dug up the whole, I, I mean, I not personally, but I, I hired people to do this part, but uh, you know, you just took up all the, in, the foundation inside. And once I had that all dug up, we discovered that the plumbing was like the clay, you know, the clay pipes. Okay. So just, I just thought, well, we got it opened up. Let's just replace this. Let's put a back check valve in. Let's put uh, um, you know, a water vent thing by the, the hot water tank. And so if that breaks and, the water's got somewhere to go uh, because there was no floor drain in, in this house at all because it's so older. And uh, yeah, so that put a lot of, uh, that helped with the insurance. So when they came in and looked at that and saw that this older home had all of that done, you know, and I put a sump pump in and uh, it added a lot, of, a lot of value and a lot of peace of mind to the tenants that I ended up having as well. Yeah. At, at that point, did you, how much experience did you have with construction? Do you have any prior? None, zero. Zero, <laughs> nothing. I hadn't started on that path yet. I hadn't yeah. even, you know. So, so, how, what, yeah. so what gave you comfort looking at this property that you said needed quite a bit of work, right? What gave you comfort in, in knowing you could buy it and, and kind of you could take care of the work and, and get everything done as it needed to be? Was it was there anything that gave you that confidence or were you just, I know that real estate is what I want to be doing, so I'm going to be doing mm -hmm. it? Well, at that point, no, that, that this is the second house. So no, I, I didn't realize that I was going to, a, a year later, I was going to buy another house and rent this one out. I, I wasn't on that platform yet. Um, so why did I have the confidence? I don't, I don't know. Oh. I mean, I, I fixed, I fixed it because I was living there and I thought I was going to stay living there. So I wanted it to be nice for me, but, uh, but certainly when it became uh, a rental property for me, it, uh, it, that, you know, put the value up, you know, in terms of assessment and helping with the tenants and getting the right tenants because it wasn't run down. Um, and they knew that their things were going to be, you know, safe and dry down in the basement and things like that. So the, yeah. the reason I was asking that is that people are, you know, you like by your own admission, right? You had no construction background. You were a dental hygienist, right? You, you weren't, you know, um, had a, you know any real prior experience apart from that first property that you had and I don't think that needed a lot of work right but people get scared of stuff that needs work right they only want to buy mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that needs that's turnkey property but mm -hmm. here you are you know you know no experience and buying a property that needs some work and I was just trying to understand maybe how how you went ahead and do, did that because but with those two houses I mean I did take on things like cosmetic stuff like mm -hmm. flooring a little bit of tiling painting swapping out the uh, new faucets and these were all things that yeah I was a little bit slow doing and taking like getting it completed but I took it on I enjoyed it I wasn't um, turned off from doing it and so then when I bought uh, when I got in started getting into the flips uh, I just I started off like I said with lipstick flips 
And these were just things that needed cosmetics. And I knew I could take all of that on and do it on a good low budget because I had done cosmetic things with all the rentals. So when I got, when I started flipping, I, you know, painting, uh, laying down laminate flooring and tiling, I had that under my belt now. It was like, I could do it quickly. I could, you know, lay a laminate floor now, like, like it's like no one's business. So, so when I got actually into flipping and yeah, with the lipstick flips, um, yeah, I'd already had those little cosmetic uh, things down. I had learned it, you know, through patience and trial and error and podcasts or sorry, um, YouTubes and stuff like that. Yeah. I was going to ask, is that how you learned? Did you learn through YouTube at university? Oh yeah. 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 I spent a, a lot, a lot of hours. I mean, there's no excuse for not knowing or taking something on yourself. I mean, there's a highway, there's a, a world of information out there. And, you know, if I didn't take this on myself and do it the way I did, I would not have had the affordability mm. to do what I do. I, I just wouldn't, you know, uh, there would be just too much debt and I'm very debt adverse. I don't like borrowing money. That's how I was raised. Um, and also living beneath my means. Uh, my mom, when I was a teenager, she said, you know, if you live beneath your means, you will never get in trouble. And I applied that when I bought my first home in my twenties, uh, the bank had approved me for, um, $200,000. And so I thought, hmm, well, if they think I can get by and manage my life and, you know, my bills and have enough to eat, if I took on a 2000 uh, mortgage, um, I should do even better and not run into trouble if I bought something cheaper. So my first house I bought for 160, even though I was approved for 200, I always wanted to keep living beneath my means, or what I was allowed to do or just everything. And I've done that I've carried that throughout my whole career now into the real estate investing. I just always get less than what I'm allowed to have. So, and that way it secures that I don't run into trouble or if I do, I can manage it and handle it. So. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's about what you feel comfortable, right? That's a great thing about real estate, right? You can leverage mm -hmm. your eyeballs or you can buy everything cash, right? It's just whatever mm -hmm. your investment strategy, there's no right or wrong, right? You can listen, you can go to these forums and listen to all mm -hmm. these stuff, and it, but it's yeah. all personal preference, right? And it's, yeah, it's not, it's a, not a one size fits all, you know, uh, every, there's so many strategies and so many platforms out there with so many points of views, but at the, at the end of the day, you just need to curate all of that and then tailor it into something that fits your situation, what you're willing to take on. And, you know, I think all of it, no matter what strategy or whatever, whether it's multifamily or doing it the way I do it or house hacking, you do need to stretch yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone, but either way, you just need to curate all of this and tailor it to something that, you know, you're not going to put yourself in a situation that you can't exit from and recover and be still be in a good position or anything like that. So, yeah. 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 And, and you know, you, you said also that you manage all your properties yourself, right? The six mm -hmm. rentals that you have, you manage I'm too cheap to hire anyone to do it. The, 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 the truth of it, the matter is I am too cheap. I am too cheap. I will not hire anyone to do anything I can do myself. So that's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> but then is it how, how time intensive is it managing these properties? It's not because the, these are well-maintained homes. I'm a very hands-on landlady. Um, I check in with my tenants, even throughout the COVID, like every second month or so, or whatever, I just check in and say, Hey, how are things? Like, is everything still good? Are you still in a good position to pay your rent? Like, you know, I don't want you to feel stressed or anything like that. So I, I'm a little bit hands on. Um, and I just have good tenants. As soon as something comes up, uh, and I tell them, I tell that to my prospective tenants, like whoever I end up choosing, and I sign the tenant with, I tell them like, you know, please, I, I want to stay on top of things, you know, as it happens, like, don't stay here, move out. And then I come into the property and I'm like, holy crap, like, you know, we could have handled some of this while you were living here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I just have that talk with them when we sign the lease. It takes an hour to sign a lease with me. <laughs> It does. It takes an hour or, or more for me to go through everything. So it's like, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good that you're thorough, right? Because also you, yeah. want, you want also a lease that has everything written out, right? So that, mm -hmm. you know, you want everything to be understood and upfront. And yeah. And I, and I tell them like, you know, if things happen, I want you to know there's 
a you thing that you need to take care of. And then there's me things, stuff that I, that I have to legally have to, you know, do. And if you're not sure, call either call the landlord tenant association, or you can call me and we'll straighten this out. Right. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. And ha- I think having that upfront conversation and letting people know that as well helps a lot because, pe- you know, tenants, tenants are as good as you train them to be to some extent right if you if you mm-hmm. let them know and yeah. let them understand the situation right then of course it's bad yep. tenants, right but for the most part if you're able to to tell them and let them understand what the situation is this is how this is going to go this is how this is going to go they understand right they know how to behave then right to some extent mm-hmm. right yeah and, and I, I like that a lot that you that you 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 kind of discuss well you don't want to come across like you don't know and i and i hate to say it but i think some tenants or prospective tenants that I've come across or interviewed, I think being a woman, they thought they could kind of walk all over me or kind of pull the wool over my eyes, or maybe I didn't have any street sense or, or I wouldn't uh, call you out on something or, you know what I mean? Uh, But uh, yeah, I might look like a little cupcake sometimes, but no, don't let the nails fool you. (laughs) I, I, I'll speak up for myself. So, and I'll, I'll call, I'll call people out. Like I had one person, she seemed like a really, really phenomenal uh, tenant. And, uh, but there was just something about, I was like, I don't know. So I drove by where she said she worked and it was an empty parking lot. So, mm-hmm. oh, okay. Maybe I got the address wrong. Maybe she wrote it down wrong. I don't know. Uh, so I called her and I called her out on it and I said, I drove by the address like did I get it wrong or I didn't read your writing did you write it down wrong but the I went by the address and that address is an empty parking lot and there's only one of two things you're doing in that parking lot and neither one of them is going to make you that me want to have you as a tenant so (laughs) is there something you want to tell me and she hung up the phone so uh I ended up tracking her down on social media and that's another thing I do any prospective tenants I track them down on their social media and see what the the truth is about stuff so yeah yeah you can yeah. find it a lot on social media right someone's facebook account a lot of times yep. you can kind of see mm-hmm. what's going oh yeah it's all there i i i track it down yeah, yeah i look it up yeah but it's smart though you you know for anyone listening you know you've got to do these things right and it may seem like a bit of work but it's worth it right it's, to put in that upfront work is worth it because again it is. i don't know what the the ontario landlord laws or landlady laws are but here, you know, it can be challenging, you know, especially if a tenant who knows what they're doing, right? If they're, if they're mm-hmm. a tenant who understands the laws, they can be very different for you, difficult for you yeah. to get them out. And even if you then do get them out, a lot of times they'll, they'll do damage and you'll, you know, you won't get rent. Mm-hmm. It just can be very expensive yeah. to, to do that. So I know it seems like a, a lot of work, uh, legwork and just due diligence the way I do it. But honestly, I think I've had, you know, I've been a landlady now for six years or a little bit. And I've had such a positive experience with it. And I contribute me going the extra mile. I contribute my success with a positive tenant uh, and landlady experience relationship. I, it, it's just worth it. It's just worth it to me. And my system works and I don't know. So, yeah. yeah. So, so after sex, you, you got a little bit, you felt like you didn't want to overextend your resources in terms of your time, your management you know of these uh yeah and uh also uh just with my uh, like those properties they have i have mortgages on them as well mm-hmm. so i was getting to that capacity where um the debt and just everything um yeah i had tapped out i was getting a little bit scared maybe i don't know if that's the word that was coming to mind mm-hmm. but also i needed something i needed a job you know what I mean? Like I, I needed something to do too to replace hygiene. Like I'm a workaholic. I, I have to do things. And uh, I'm that person who is just like, oh man, what am I going to do when I'm 80 or 90? Like, you know, like, uh, like I have to keep busy. I have to be productive. I have to be working towards something and doing something. And so flipping houses really filled that void and a lot of need for me. So it gave me a job to go to, to do. It gave me a creative um, outlet. Um, it, uh, it extended myself. I need to be challenged too, because I get bored really fast. Uh, so it, it just challenged me, like, you know, taking it on and scaring myself and, and then being successful with it and going, oh crap, you know, I did that, you know, and I live to tell about it. So on to the next one. <laughs> so. well, interesting. You left after six rentals, you, you felt like you were in a position financially from those rentals to leave your uh, uh, hygienist, the dental hygienist job. Oh yeah. 
Oh yeah. Well, Even with two properties, my, my cash flow is pretty good because with uh, one of my strategies too, when I got into flipping, um, again, this goes back to me being uh, debt adverse. I started paying, uh, so some of the profit from each flip, I kept putting towards some of the, uh, the rentals that I have so that those mortgages could uh, get chopped down or get rid of them. And once those mortgages, now that's pure passive income. So, and that puts me in a really good position, in my opinion. So, mm. Well, how, yeah. how was that decision in leaving your job, right? Because it's- so Not hard. People, oh, really? You want no. to get a sense of, of what comes next? Were you going to be okay? You know, because a, a lot of people have that, right? They want to, maybe they get to that position where um, their income from rentals is replacing what they can make at the, the W-2. I knew three years after being, uh, working as a dental hygienist that I was going to have to find something else. I couldn't see myself going, well, I mean, I need a job and being a hygienist is a good paying job. I was getting uh, anywhere from 42 to $45 an hour, which is a good paying job. Mm -hmm. um, and I was getting a lot of hours, but after three years, I was just like, nope, this ain't gonna work for me. I, I can't see me doing this until the day I retire. I, I, I need something else. I don't know what it is yet, but I need to find it or I'm gonna go crazy. And, and it did, it fell on my lap. Like I said, it, it, my house was up for sale. It didn't sell. And I got on that path and I was like, oh my God, you know, this is, this is it. I think this is it. I'm gonna make it work. I'm gonna do this. I'm, yeah, so that's what I did. So when you went into flipping, how, how were you finding deals? Were you just, find, were they finding them on the MLS there? or what? MLS, um, because at that time, my real estate knowledge and know-how and just everything was limited. I, uh, and honestly, when I discovered Instagram and I'm coming across all of these things on Instagram, I was like, oh my God, like how have, I, how have I managed to do this not knowing the real term for this or that there were so many alternatives and you know, and things like this, it's, it's really opened my uh, mind and it has, um, and this is why it's so important to, you know, reach out and find knowledge and find people who do what you do, who are experienced in knowledge and, and build off that and bounce off and, and expand your game or your portfolio and push yourself out of your comfort zone too. I think that's so important. Um, because I'm not a scaredy cat. I, 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 I love, uh, I love challenging. Like I said, I get bored very easily and I will do things. I'm not, I don't know how to swim. So I'm that type of person who will jump into the deep end and then Google on the way down. How do you swim? <laughs> you know, watch a YouTube video. Like I'm like that person. I, I like taking on those challenges and calculated risks and stuff like that. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, but now, are you are you buying them through wholesalers now? How at this point, after uh, no or... wholesaling, to my understanding, when I came across that word, it was probably a couple of years ago. I don't know how I came across that word or heard it, and I asked my realtor. Um, I'm like, what is this wholesaling thing? And he said it's more of a, uh, a U.S. thing. It's not a Canadian uh -huh. thing. Um, but from what I've been coming across and what I've been seeing here in Canada the past year uh, and what I've been learning, it seems like it's, um, it's, it's maybe it's become more common and accepted here in Ontario or Canada, but it's definitely a thing here, but I just never realized that. Um, but I've had really good uh, luck and I'm very happy with the price that I pay for the houses I get and how I acquire them. And um, so I haven't um, looked at uh, other options of wholesaling or off market deals or, but I do know how to go, but thanks to Instagram, yeah. I know how to reach out and find these people now, you know, that do that, so. Yeah, so, yeah. so how you, you were buying these with traditional financing there, putting 20, 25, 30%, whatever down? No, my flips okay. are bought in cash. Ah. Okay. I have a very, I, my, my offers on this, um, I have a lot of competition when it comes to flipping. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not the only little flipper out there, <laughs> it turns out. Uh, so, you know, when you, when I see a deal that I really want to sink my teeth in and I want it because I see that the numbers add up for me, um, my, my offers are very clean. It's cash. It's no conditions. It's, do you want to close next week? Do you want to close in two weeks? Do you want to close? 30 days is the maximum I will give people to close. It's like none of this two months. Uh, but uh, yeah, usually I close in two weeks. I have a phenomenal lawyer. Uh, I've used the same lawyer throughout the, all my years. And um, 
he does things in a very expedited manner for me and gets it done in the time frame. So yeah. So he works with me, you know, in what I need. So yeah. yeah. So do you have an agent involved or, or, or do you represent? Yes, I have a real estate agent. I've used to. So when I started out flipping, I it started off in Niagara Falls. Um, you must be familiar with that area, right? right. Yeah. You know, Niagara Falls. That's so I'll say Niagara Falls area because there's, there's like Niagara Falls, St. Catharines, well and Font Hill. So that whole area right there at our little communities. And I never wanted to pay more than $180,000 for um, a flip or a rental house, you know, or anything. That, that was my cap. 200,000 was my cap, but I've, I've stayed around the 180K. And I was not able to find flips in that price range anymore in the Niagara area. So I went on MLS, I went on realtor.ca and typed in Ontario, 200,000, you know, and looked at the areas that came up in Ontario where I could buy a house for $200,000 or less. And, you know, and I just transported, transplanted myself to those communities and went there and um, yeah, then just did what I did. Like that's where the concessions, um, I guess, you know, I, I'm, I'm willing to move to tertiary uh, markets to stay within my comfort zone and like, price range um so yeah that's uh, that's where the concessions and the sacrifices have come in for me because I literally transported myself from Niagara and now I'm in Windsor which is five hours away so I didn't know a soul down there I did not know anybody I didn't have a team I did not have uh, if I needed someone to help me with electrical or plumbing I, I had to start all over again and find that team so yeah. wow so how were you able to do did you did you move there yourself? Did you physically move there? Or were you really? Didn't know so. Yeah. It, and it got, it, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was hard. It was hard. It got lonely. So. <laughs> but, but when you moved there, so you moved there, you, you, did you move there by buying a house or do you renting? Yeah. Did you do Airbnb? Yeah. Okay. No, I bought a flip. I bought a flip. Oh, so you did a live-in flip. Yes. Yeah. Ah, okay. I, I always, I've lived, I've always lived in all my flips. Yeah. Wow. I've always, always, okay. always. So every yeah. single flip that you do, you live in them? Every single flip. Ah. Why is, what, is there a reason behind that? Or does it just, just make sense for you? It makes sense to me because it doesn't make sense for me to have this flip that I'm paying for. I have insurance on it. I'm paying for the utilities on it. Um, it doesn't make sense for me to, at the end of the day, I'm going to go over to this house now that I could have rented out and I'm making money off of it. So I have a house, you know, uh, so stay here, you know, and not, and not go home to this one to shower or eat because I could be having that rented out, you know, like that could be making me money. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. It didn't make sense to me. And I'm very cheap. I'm very cheap. So I, I want to maximize my uh, income and I know it's not for everyone that my strategy and how I've done this, it's not for everybody. It's, it's you, you've got to be a little bit batshit crazy uh, <laughs> to do it. Uh, because like I said, like the house that I'm in now, it wasn't habitable when I bought it. And I actually have a uh, video up on my Instagram. It's uh, it, I took it and I put it up. It's uh, I took it seven o'clock AM my first night that I spent at that house. And uh, yeah, yeah. What, that, what, let's just say the that? smells in this house kept me up the whole night. Oh. It kept me up the whole night. <laughs> the smells were horrific. Uh, just to give you an idea, the bathroom, uh, it's uh, lace and plaster walls. I ended up having to take that whole bathroom right to the, down to the studs and remove everything because the floor and the walls were um heavily stained with human stuff oh yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that all had to be removed <laughs> and it, and you know and once i started removing these things it it started eliminating the sources of the odors that were in this house so yeah but you say that initially and these smells were in the house or initially when you were stay, actually sleeping in the house yeah, I, I lived there from day one. As soon as as soon as I get the key, within the hour of me having the key from my lawyer, I'm already there. I hit the ground running. I start hauling things out. I have a truck and I start just demoing within the hour. Within the hour. 
<laughs> that's incredible. I love that's dedication. Yeah, that's dedication. I don't waste any time. I don't waste any time. My scheduling and everything and all my plan, it's it's all there when I get the keys the day. I've already got people lined up, like, you know, when I'm going to bring my electrician in, when I'm going to bring in my plumber. Uh, that's all already set up. Yeah, long before, like, you know, leading the before I close on the house. And even with this house, I had to put all new windows in this house. I had those windows ordered two weeks, a week and a half before I closed on the house. I'd already got that ball rolling even before I got the keys. So, well, how, how do you, how, how is it just been a process to learn when to, when to bring everything, when to bring the plumber, when to bring the window yep. to do? Yep. Obviously it's, you just, it's just learning. It's just common sense. Um, and I'm very militant about it. And yeah, I just have it boom, boom, boom. I have it all scheduled up and I've got that, uh, I've got it uh, all figured out, you know, on closing day, how, how what, what's gonna happen on what day? I've already bought my flooring. I've already bought all the light fixtures. I've already bought a lot of the renovation materials. It's all there in my storage locker waiting for me to go pick up, pick up, pick up. So now I'm not wasting time by you know, going to the stores and going, oh, what flooring am I going to use? What, like, no, it's all there in my storage locker. I just go pick it up, boom, 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 and it's done. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a part of my system. That's a, like, uh, like, you know, when I was talking about earlier, like, you know, I have my systems in play because uh, I'm there by myself. The only, 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 only thing that I do not do is electrical and plumbing. And that's for legal reasons because I have uh, commercial insurance on my properties. And they require that I, if I do anything like that, it has to be by a licensed bondable person, which I'm more than happy to do because I, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I don't want to yeah. do that. No, you're amazing. <laughs> you're amazing. I love, I love how you, how you do everything, how you approach it. How, out of yes. interest, when, when you moved markets, right, you were up and changed different markets that was five hours away. How were you able, and you didn't know a soul, how were you able to build a team then, you know, from scratch? From so, scratch? When I got there, I didn't know anyone. Uh, my first flip in Windsor, it did need electrical. And this was my first flip that I got into where I had graduated to, okay, I'm, t I'm doing full on rewiring of a house now. Um, I'm going to be doing things like um, installing a rough in uh, for a bathroom. So I had to find those people. And I was bringing people in the first week that I was in the house, you know, interviewing people. Cause I always get three to five quotes, you know, from everybody. And then I cross reference what everybody says and, yeah. you know, and all of this. And I, and I look out for different things and personality and professionalism and communication and how do they give me the quote and the estimate. I look out for all of these things and um, you know, how I feel like we're going to work together and how they're going to deal with me because I can be a little bit bossy. And, uh, so, um, you know, they, I have to know that they can handle that with good humor. You know, I, you know, I'll be firm, I'll be nice about it, but if I have something to say, but you know, some men don't take well to that, you know? And so that ha it has to be a good fit, a good, uh, working cultural thing, you know, I guess. Um, but so how I found this, and I do believe you have these stores down and so I wasn't having any good luck doing it this way. And I was at Home Depot and I was mentioning to someone there how I was looking for an electrician, but I wasn't having any luck. And they were like, well, have you tried our referral program? And I'm like, no, what is that? Yeah. So uh, the referral program is where contractors uh, give their contact information to Home Depot. Home Depot vets these people. They do back, uh, criminal background checks. They do everything. So I went to customer service and said, oh, I would like to use your referral program. I need an electrician. So they sent three people to me and I had, uh, they contacted three electricians, three electricians contacted me and I picked the one that I wanted. I really liked him and just everything. And so I've used him now in all my flips down there. And also when I found him, a part of like, I love his work ethic. I love his integrity. And so I thought, okay, he's going to know other people, trades people that I know, and he's probably going to have respect and gravitate towards people who are work like him. And so I just said, Neil, I need a plumber. Neil, I need a roofer. Um, and he would refer people to me and I love them. They, they just worked out. It just really worked out. And I've kept the same team uh, now every, every house that I've done down there. I'm, I, I just, I'm wrapping up my fourth house in Windsor. 
it will probably be the fifth or sixth, but you know, with COVID, I, I had a six month uh, shutdown window. So, yeah. Well, yeah, there's, I've never heard of the Home Depot referral uh, thing. I'm going to actually look into that. Hopefully they have that here because that could be huge, right? That could be if they're, if yeah. they're these people, it usually means... Every podcast I do, I keep throwing it out there. And I'm not endorsed by Home Depot. <laughs> I think I should be. Yeah, you know, I, I've recommended well, this. I've, I've have it up on my IG. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the referral program at Home Depot. <laughs> you need, yeah, you need to call Home Depot up and give them... A, every time you shout out, they need to give you some money for that. I know. <laughs> but I also want to put this in too. If people People use that still vet the people yeah. who come like don't don't i know uh home depot does their vetting of these in the criminal checks but still do your own vetting of the people that you choose so you still do your due diligence and kind of figure it out too but, well, yeah. well, what what vetting do you do on them right but past the once they once you get that yeah. referral what, okay. what? <laughs> no. electrical yeah let's, let's just go with that for an example I don't know shit about electrical or code or, you know, anything like that or what's code and what's required and all of that crap. But if I know the electrical work that I want done, I will literally go on YouTube. I will spend six, eight hours looking up electrical code, Ontario electrical code. I will look at, you know, the different materials and what's what and this and that. So the first time that Neil came to the house to give me a quote on electrical, we're walking to the house and I'm telling him what I, I want and what I want used. And he's like, he turned around and he looked at me. He's like, you know something about electrical? Hmm. And I go, I don't. He goes, yes, you do. And I said, no, I don't. And he goes, yes, you do. And I said, no, I don't. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so he was a little confused, but the thing was, I had educated myself on different terms and uh, terminology that electricians might use. So that way, when the guy comes in, I can have some, even though I don't know what I'm talking about, I come across like I know what I'm talking about. And now they can't pull the wool over my eyes or I can't be overquoted. I can't be taken advantage of. <laughs> like yeah. So I bluff it. I, I have a good poker face. For that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good, right? It's important that because obviously... If, if they think you know enough that you, mm -hmm. you know, they can't, and essentially you don't, you want someone anyway that wouldn't pull the wool, that wouldn't do that. Yes, so and, and these people try. wouldn't do that. These these right. people wouldn't right. do that. Everyone that it has, yeah. So, but, but you do all that for all the trades, you know, for 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 the plumbing <laughs> as well, for anything. Yep. You do all that research so that you you kind of know. Yeah. I love that. I love that. You got that de definitely dedicated. I, I, I well, I mean, no one's going to know my, it, it protects me too, you know, um, because I don't want work done and a shady work or, or, you know, it's not done to code or it's not done properly because the person who's buying this house, um, they're going to have, they're, they're going to do a home inspection, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not an authority to say, Oh, you did this plumbing for me or you're electrical and it's not done right. Like I'm not, educated enough to recognize but a home inspector or someone is going to know that and recognize a shoddy work better than myself you know so I don't want it to affect uh, the offer that's coming in on my house I don't want it to be in a position where I've got to re have this redone now or you know it's, it's going to be more costly so it's just better to again like I do with my tenants you know it's just better to do that extra work and leg work and just find someone who does it right and does it right the first time yeah 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 oh, I, I love your work ethic you got an amazing work ethic there's no, no doubt about that. i have an insane work ethic yeah and if you ask me the questions that you said you wanted to ask me earlier about the the stuff you'll yeah. you'll i'll answer that and you'll see how crazy i am with the work ethic yeah okay well we'll, we'll get to that in one second but, <laughs> but um, i just wanted what's what's next for you you think you just keep flipping keep doing flips or do you, do you have uh, other visions of something else in, in real estate is it just what's your so, future, what's your future i mean with each flip with each flip my confidence grows you know my knowledge my experience with the whole thing and i also um like if you look at some of my before and afters how it's the the decor the interior the design that's all a part of the whole package for my flips uh you know i love the whole finished product now i've got to put the the bows and ribbons and the icing on the cake you know i, I don't sell the houses empty uh they're always um i hate to use the word staged i hate that word but um they look nice and i and i enjoy all of that and um so I want to graduate into more higher end flips where I can, the features that I like in my homes and I enjoy, I want to put those in homes that people, the seller or the buyer, sorry, is going to recognize it and appreciate it. 
So I want to get into that. And uh, I also want to acquire two more rentals, possibly um, now that I'm feeling more confident um, and more knowledgeable. And I have, I feel like I have more resources and people to reach out to. I would like to look into uh, multifamily. Uh, so I might do that. I might take that plunge. Yeah. yeah, you should. You should. I think you'd be great at it. No doubt about it. Yeah. Well, cool. Hey, this is, uh, you got a really cool story and I love how you're doing everything, right? It's, it's, uh, you're definitely diving in, right? You, there's no doubt about it. Getting your hands dirty. I'm crazy. I'm crazy. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think it's all. I think you're, I think you're amazing. I think uh, it's amazing. What but you're I, doing. I, I don't work. I don't like working for other people. And that was a part of the, the problem with being a hygienist, uh, mm -hmm. the work culture and the work environment. It wasn't, the career and the work environment that I thought it would be. I thought it would be in my own operatory and, you know, working with my own patients. And I didn't take into account when I entered that career that it was going to be what it was. And it just ended up that I wasn't uh, working as independently as I independently as I thought I originally would be. And that kind of, I, and I'm, I'm bossy. I'll admit it. <laughs> I'll admit it. <laughs> uh, I'll come clean. I'm a little bossy and I'm definitely a leader, not a follower. And so there was some budding of heads and I just need to be in an environment, a work environment where I can control it and uh, have creativity over it. And, you know, just, just everything and be in control of, you know, how things are going to go and financially and just everything. So, yeah. Yeah, you're in the right business then, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. Real estate really checked off a lot of those boxes. It gave me, um, yeah, because now I'm in charge of my financial, um, my financial paycheck, you know what I'm saying? Like it's, uh, it can be as big or as small or grow and, or it can, I can stay where I'm at right now, you know, and uh, be what it is. But I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe I'll take on you know, like a challenge, maybe a multifamily, maybe a little triplex or a fourplex just to start out. So, yeah. Yeah. And that, like you just said there, right. That's the great thing about real estate is that it can be whatever you want it to be, right. Mm -hmm. You want to have mm -hmm. one rental and just work on that one and have it, or do you want to have a hundred rentals, right? Whatever you can be, you, there's no limit to what you can achieve in this business. And I love that. Absolutely. Business. Yeah. You're only crazy. limited by what you will put in or not put into it. It's exactly. yeah, it's definitely up to you. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, as this show is called wrestling with real estate, I'd like to ask some wrestling related real estate questions. Um, and I think you're ready for this. So um, what, what would your wrestling name be if you picked one for yourself? You think? Jabber J. <laughs> Jabba J. <laughs> Why? Because you like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. <laughs> it. It's a nickname that someone gave me a long time ago. <laughs> okay, I like it. Jabba, um, Jabba J. Jabba J. That, that, that's great. Um, what? Every wrestler has a special move. What is your special move in real estate? You think? I biggest strength. My biggest strength is probably I, I take very, I, I will push myself out of my comfort zone and take, I'm not scared. I won't let lack of knowledge or experience. I won't use that as an excuse to not take something on or try something. Um, and I just do my due diligence. Um, and I go at my own pace. I make sure I don't paint myself into a corner and I have strategies to, um, handle everything, you know, whether it's my mindset or um, how I run my tenants and just, I have a system played and I build on it and, and it's always evolving. And uh, as I see fit and my needs and the circumstances. So I don't stay stagnant with how I do things. I'm willing to evolve and open my mind to different things to make my game better or run more efficiently or. Yeah. yeah. No. I, and I think it's, part of evolution, right? You've got to put yourself in that discomfort, right? You talked mm -hmm. about it a few times, like put yourself in that uncomfortable situation. That's where your growth is, right? If you're always comfortable, yeah. you, it's very hard to grow in that. But if you mm -hmm. put yourself in those dis dis uncomfortable mm -hmm. situations and you're growing and you're learning and you're evolving, it's 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 a huge strength. So yeah. that, I would put work ethic as well. There's no doubt, like work ethic is definitely a big strength that you have as well. I think that's- um, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, without a doubt. So what's been the biggest body slam you've taken in your real estate investing career? Um, okay. So my last flip, which I closed on March 12th, um, that property had a beautiful, beautiful garage, detached a garage. It was two story. It was in mint condition. It was a two car, two story hydro, everything. 
And so I had everything in there. I had all my furniture in there, stuff that I used to, you know, furnish the house. I had all my um, personal effects in there, my family photos, my baby pictures, uh, everything. All my personal effects were in that garage. My renovation materials, um, all my tools, I had my bandsaw and everything all set up in the garage. Well, there was a little fire bug in Windsor. They haven't caught him yet, but he torched my garage. Oh. And everything was gone. Everything was gone in seven minutes. And I was about three weeks away from putting that house up on the market. And the day before I had literally bought about $2,500 worth of trim, interior doors, all the baseboards and all of that. And it was all gone and all my tools, like all my, and you know, um, when you're doing renovations and you acquire your little thingy majiggies or your whatsamacallits or the thingies, you know, all those little quirky little things that you acquire and buy and not to mention like all my uh, wet tile saws, um, just everything, it was all gone. And I had to uh, just start all over uh, acquiring things. But uh, when the fire happened, I, uh, I just went out and immediately bought the tools and things that I needed to complete the job so that I could just, you know, get it completed, get it back up on the market and get it done. Yeah. So that was a huge setback in a lot of ways in terms of the insurance companies and because now there's a claim and, you know, and all this crap and, you know, not to mention the, uh, the personal, uh, uh, emotionally, it, it just set me back and I was glad and it was a blessing that on March 12th, you know, I was exhausted mentally and physically more than I was admitting to. So when I got to come home, it was just like that break was like, yeah, I'm, I'm exhausted. And I didn't even allow myself that break to, you know, I just went right back at it and tried to, you know, finish the house. So, yeah. 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 I'm sorry yeah. that happened. I'm sorry that happened. <laughs> Shit happens. <laughs> very true. Very true. You, you can't cry about it. You got to get up and just brush yourself off and go get the job done. So, yeah. Yeah. And keep moving forward. Right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Um, so was there a moment that you were standing on the top rope, getting ready to jump, but you were too scared? What was it and how did you overcome it? I don't know if there is one with you because you seem kind of fearless to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm hoping to overcome it this year. Like I said, when you asked me, like, you know, what do I plan on doing this year? And that's taking on going into jumping into some multi uh, family. So five years ago, six years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit longer. I don't know. My God, I sat, I was sitting on a beautiful opportunity in Niagara Falls. This was a fiveplex uh, apartment building. I went to see and, and, and entertain the thought of, you know, buying it. I did all the numbers, the numbers worked. Um, it, it was just a phenomenal price. Um, it was in great condition. It had the, the laundry room, uh, it generated income. It just everything, it took care of itself. Um, it had uh, tenants that where I could see the, the rent history and how they paid, you know, that was all provided. I met all the tenants. I'd gone into all, I'd met everybody. Uh, and I just backed up because I was too scared to inherit five tenants. Um, I, I liken it to like, you know, if you're going to have your first child, you don't want to find out that you're having five babies at once. You just want to start off with one at a time and see how that goes. And, and try that on for size. And then maybe you'll think about having another one. So I, I, I yeah, my confidence in, in myself and my capability of handling five tenants was at once, um, was overwhelming for me and I walked away. But now uh, I, I do regret that because there is not a hope in hell that you can even buy a house for 350 in the Niagara area, let alone a, a, a decent in shape fiveplex. You know, that's, you know, I mean, the cheapest house you can buy in St. Catharines is um, a shit box for like maybe 400,000. And that's like seven or 800 square feet. Like that's how bad the, or how good the market has changed and evolved over the past five or six years down there. Um, so yeah, so like, yeah, I'm going to overcome that maybe, uh, hopefully, with uh, this year, uh, depending on COVID and things like this, I'm going to be monitoring this as well. Uh, but yeah, maybe getting into my first multifamily. I'm going to take that on. Just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Multifamily is awesome. I love multifamily. Well, Jacqueline, this has been awesome. This has been a lot of fun um, hearing your story, hearing how you've done everything, right? I love that you have that I'm going to do it attitude, right? And that you're going to 
you know, do whatever it takes to make it happen as well, right? And they mm-hmm. have the work ethic to match and that skill set as well, right? And don't, let's not underestimate the skills that you have as well. It's mm-hmm. obviously learned and, and dedicated yourself to, to being good at all these things. It's, it's amazing. So I, I love that. Um, so I appreciate you sharing all that stuff. Um, but before, yeah, you. you're welcome. Yeah. Before, before we go though, where can people find out more about you? If they want to hear about what's going on with you, if they want to reach out and get in touch with you, what, what yeah. can you do so? Uh, they want design. Baywalk Design okay. on Instagram. Yeah. Baywalk Design on Instagram. Okay, I'll, I'll include that uh, um, that link in the show notes and in the description below so anyone can reach out to you. Yeah. There. Go, 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 follow, go follow Jacqueline on, on that. Um, she has a lot of yeah. cool content on there. <laughs> you get to see what she's up to. So uh, definitely go ahead and do that. Well, hey, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time. And um, yeah, have an awesome rest of your day out there in Ontario. Yeah, no, thank you for this opportunity and letting me share this and hopefully someone some budding investor you know has a takeaway and go hey you know her approach and how she did it maybe i'll employ some of that and take that and start doing it and you know they're big moguls after a while <laughs> yeah well i'm gonna home, home depot referral i'm using that for sure i'm gonna check that out <laughs> they better have that otherwise i'm gonna be very angry with home depot i know they need to endorse me i keep mentioning <laughs> it on my instagram because people on instagram will ask me like oh how do you how are you finding your your contractors and this and that or they dm me and you know and i've done like uh i don't know three or four podcasts now and every time you know I, I mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> well very cool well thank you so much i appreciate it thank you <laughs>